Good morning and happy and peaceful and healthy 2021. Um, I haven't seen you since last year. Wow. Uh, and lots of ha lots has happened. So I pray that um, all of you had an enjoyable and memorable, warm and, and uh, wonderful holiday season with your families and friends and at church or wherever you went. Uh, perhaps you went uh, to see family away or whatever, but I pray that it was a blessing in your life. And then we went through the new year and uh, we've had an inauguration just yesterday. So lots of, has, has happened and a lot is ahead of us. So um, I just wanna welcome you back. Thanks for letting me take that time off to be with my family and to get a little bit of rest and um, just enjoy the season. I sure, I sure did. I sure did enjoy it with my family and very, 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 very blessed uh, just that Jesus came. Um, and several of, uh, I've gotten several texts uh, and messages like, when are we gonna start Bible study again? So that was good. That was an encouragement to know that, uh, that, we, that we wanted to start again to be together. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, and again, I pray that this year will be a year of peace and, and uh, prosperity. And I don't mean money, but God's prosperity in our lives and in your family, where you work, in your community or your church, um, in your marriage with just you and your sweetheart, um, or wherever you are, that God would bless us together as we learn. Um, this is going to be an exciting few weeks for me because I have never taught on this before. I, I was going in a completely different direction uh, to, to, to start again, and um, the Lord just changed that. And he, he, he does that so beautifully. He stops you, but he doesn't abruptly knock you over. <laughs> At least for me, he doesn't. And um, just these thoughts begin to come in my mind in these pictures, and I thought, wow, I've never really thought of those things. And so I said, Lord, is, is this the direction that we're heading? Uh, and if it is, then I want to do that. So you and I will be learning together in these next weeks. And I want to tell you what it is that we're going to be talking about. And that is how we dress ourselves. Uh, what a way to start the new year, right? New clothes. Uh, and, and, and so I'm going to spend this first time these next 30 minutes, just giving you foundation. So you sort of get the idea of where we're going. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to really start into the meat of it until next week, but I want to give you a real cross the board foundation about what we're going to talk about, how I dress, how do I dress? Um, the importance of how we dress ourselves biblically to address our culture and the kingdom. That's what we're gonna be talking. Have you ever heard someone or have you said, oh, it doesn't matter what you wear? Well, the truth is it matters. It matters culturally and it matters physically and it very much matters spiritually. And so, uh, as I said, the foundation I'm gonna lay out for you right now, just just to get, so you get the idea of where we're heading with this teaching and what the Lord, I believe, wants to teach all of us. Um, so there are dress restrictions that we don't even really think about how we dress and influences our lives all the time. So let's look at some examples as a foundation for this. Uh, school, uh, there's school uniforms uh, and almost every school has them and they're compulsory. You don't get to choose. I don't want my child to do that. If that child goes to that school, then they wear those uniforms. And the uniforms are, are picked out and the, all the children look the same, very homogenous. And it's done for several reasons. Uh, to avoid competition so that the, the person that has uh, maybe a lot more money or influence can, 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 um, can dress a certain way. Um, that's economic, economic sensitivity. And also... Uh, for me, it saves any morning arguments with children. Uh, I wish we would have had school uniforms when my kids went to school, but we didn't. And so uh, every, I mean, I know parents every single morning, parents get into a fuss with their kids. You can't wear that. You just wore that three days in a row or, you know, on and on, or that's, that's not good for school. You can't blah, blah, and on and on. And it's so stressful to start out your morning um, fuss, fussing with your kids. And so 
when you have uniforms and everything's across the board, it saves that. And also, one of the other reasons um, is crime. Uh, some kids have been beaten up and killed for their tennis shoes or their book bag or, or their shirts or their uh, jackets that they wear. And so that's one of the areas in our culture that we very, very easily accept how we dress and why we dress that way. And we comport to that. We, we acquiesce to that. Um, how about the military? In the military, there's uniforms for every single branch. And if you know the military, you can spot them a mile away. Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, uh, Marines. Um, Gary was a Marine and, and he was proud of that uniform. And if you know anything about the military, once you see someone in the uniform, you can, someone can, who's, um, who's versed in this can look at that uniform and they can say, they can learn all kinds of things without ever asking any questions. They can see the rank, of the person wearing it. They can understand any ribbons, medals, any colors, um, the division that that person was part of because the what the person is wearing speaks volumes even though no words are exchanged. What we wear speaks about who we are, whether we say anything or not. And that's so true in the, in the military. What about prisons? What's the first thing that an escapee does when they escape prison? They get rid of the prison clothes, don't they? Yeah, they, they, they discard it and they steal or whatever they have to do to get something where they'll just fit in because the prison uniform, the clothes that they wear reveals they could be real trouble to you. You better lock your door and they could be danger, they're lawless. And so they wanna get rid of anything that would identify them with being a prisoner. Um, in employment, uh, I worked for 31 years for Dr. Belil, and I was part of a wonderful dental team. And one of the things that we did whenever we um, traveled, like to conferences, and or if we even did something in our own uh, area, we went to a, a you know some kind of a, a community outreach. We had these uniforms that we wore that we were noted by. They, we all wore the white jacket, and then little scarves around our necks. We had tons of them, tons of these scarves. And so anybody that saw us, even if we were separated, they knew, oh, that's Dr. Belil's team. There's those white jackets and those scarves around their neck. And what that did is that identified us. And for us, we realized that we represented not only just ourselves, but we represented by the clothes that we were wearing Dr. Bolil and our entire dental office. So your white jacket couldn't be like stained or you didn't want your scarf to be a different scarf. Those scarves were decided on ahead of time. So you picked out of your pile, whatever scarf we decided on. And that's what we wore. And the reason we did that was because we wanted to identify and we wanted to work as a team so that we could be picked out. And it, it, it helped us to be proud. We're on this team and also to comport ourselves in that correct way. Um, because I wanted to identify with this team. And so I made sure that my white jacket was okay and that I picked out the right scarf and we were there. And, um, and we accepted that. How about sports? Billions, literally with a B is made selling sports paraphernalia. Jackets and sweatpants and sweatshirts and shirts and caps and gloves. Everything that you can imagine is emblazoned with a sports team. And the we, the consumer, buys it up. And it makes us feel like we're part of the team. I remember when, uh, I, I'm a Redskin fan, or I, I was uh, for many, many years. And, um, when they won the Super Bowl, we laughed. I laughed at ourselves because we said, we won. We won. Uh, no, I wasn't out on the, <laughs> on the gridiron. I wasn't catching any passes or kicking any field goals. But we were branded with that. And, oh, for our office, whenever it was um, Redskin Cowboy Week, we, our office was filled with all kinds of um, Redskin paraphernalia because we identified with that team. That's our team, and I see it all the time. In our house, you, you can see little orange paws 
on things. And that's because we're Clemson Tiger fans. Now I'm down south and John, my son-in-law, who I live with, our daughter and son, well, he's a real Clemson fan. And so you, it doesn't even have to say the name. When I take our little dog, Henry, for a walk, I walk around our area here um, where we live and I see little orange paws on uh, the back of cars and I see them on mailboxes and on porches and on flags. And it doesn't even say Clemson. It doesn't need to because it's been branded. The wearer, we know that's what that is. Clemson Tigers and they're our team. And um, we have, um, we have uh, identity. We identify with what we see. And that goes on and on about any kind of team. Even, um, even kids that are, are playing sports, um, you know, in a, a league sports or, or the ones from middle school or high school or, 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 and then you go into college in the NFL, there's things to wear. We wear because we identify and we want to show our support. And so what we wear, again, speaks whose side we're on, who we root for, who's part of our identity. Law enforcement is next. Law enforcement, they wear things that identify them apart from other citizens. So they don't just look like other citizens. You can, a law enforcement officer has a certain uniform and it says, and they see, we see the badge and we see the, the big belt and we see this and we identify that is a police officer. That's a law enforcement official. Um, and different countries have different hats and sashes and on all kinds of things. But, but even in a different country, you can pick out a law enforcement official. What about undercover? That's something to think about, isn't it? And that's interesting because the undercover officer has the same authority as the officer that has the uniform that you can see. It's just that you can't quickly identify who that person is and what they're doing. And we'll get into that later. Um, so, and of course, if they're undercover and you're not doing anything wrong, it doesn't matter what authority that they have. But all of these things, uh, we've talked about education, the military, prison, employment, sports, and law enforcement. All of these things have to do with how those involved in that sphere are dressed and what that dress says about them. What, I, what it says about their identity and how we respond to what we see them wear. What about medical workers? Oh yeah, have you ever seen one of those really old movies where it shows um, nurses? And you could, those old movies, you could spot a nurse like two blocks away. They wore these gigantic headdresses that stuck way out. I don't even know how they held their head up, much less didn't fall into the bed when they bent over to help the patient. They were gigantic and they seemed very cumbersome and they had long sleeves and aprons and, and all of this, but they were very easily identified, more so even than, than the doctors. Um, uh, but... Now in, um, in hospitals, there's uh, surgeons and nurses and even volunteers. My mom was a pink lady. And you could tell that she was a pink lady because guess what she wore? A really pretty pink jacket over her clothes. And she would help people to their rooms and she would take the magazines up and she would do all those things that pink ladies do. She never had to say, hi, I'm a pink lady. No, she didn't have to say that because you could see who she was because of what she was wearing, the clothes that she wore. And then also in teenage years, there was candy stripers and they wore those cute little pinafores with uh, uh, red or pink stripes on them uh, tied at the back. Uh, and they looked so cute and they did the same thing. They were servants of those that were in the hospital and it was wonderful. But again, they never had to say, I'm a candy striper. You could tell they were a candy striper, and then you could ask accordingly. Even beauticians, they have their own their own uniform and their tools, and um, and you can see as they begin to 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 come out, you can say, "Oh, that's the one that's going to wait on me. That's not just another um, uh, patient, or that's not just another customer." Um, how about organizations like the Boy Scouts? Yeah, they're very recognizable. The Girl Scouts, they come to your door. 
and they knock on your door and you go to the door and they're standing there and their big eyes look up with you, up at you. And they say, would you like to buy some cookies? It's hard not to say no to that. I was part, my sister and I were part of 4-H. Does anybody remember 4-H? Yeah, I don't even know if they still have it, but it was uh, it was patterned along like Girl Scouts. But we lived on a farm, and I don't know if that's the reason that we we got to be part of 4-H or not. But we had green uniforms too, and we wore a white blouse, and we had these little patches that you could earn. And the 4-H was in the of uh, in a four a four leaf clover, and each of the little clover pieces, um, the um, petals had an H on it and it stood for heart, hand, health, and head. And so we learned about these, you know, how we think and what, we, what we're what we doing to keep our head clear and, and to learn. And then our heart so that our morals were pure and good and our hands working hard. We need to work, get out there. Oh yeah, we did a lot of work. And our health, to eat healthy and to be healthy and to exercise and do all of those things. And you know what? I was really proud to be part of the 4-H. I was proud of my uniform. And if anybody saw me and those that four-leaf clover and the patch, they would know, oh, Vicki and Linda, my sister and I, they're part of the 4-H club. And so, again, it was a branding and how this, the clothes speak. Um, and by the way, we didn't sell um, cookies. I wish we would have. But we didn't. But we did a lot of work, and I learned a lot about cooking and and um, planting and all of those things. And, and it was it, it was fun. And being and being um, a, a farm kid, it was lots of fun. The next one that I want to stress is the court system, and what the court system, what their rules are about how you dress. I can remember years ago that I went and represented our office in court for what they call warrants in debt. And this was several people that owed us money um, that did not pay. And you would you send them a notice and you let them know, we're gonna take this to court if you don't pay. And sometimes they didn't. And so I was the one that was chosen because uh, I was the office manager to go to court. And so I remember this one day I'm waiting in court and you know, you can be there all day or you can be there just you know an hour. Depends on how you were called. And so I was waiting to be called and I had my papers in my hand and um, the next people that were called were these two teenagers. And I don't know what they were there for, but I remember what happened. The judge was looking down at her papers, seeing what, the, what was coming up for her to adjudicate. And she looked up and she stopped and she looked down at those two teenage boys. And this is what she said. You get out of my courtroom right now. You go home, you clean up, you put on shoes and socks and clean clothes and tuck them in, and then you come back to this courtroom before we're done. And the, and I remember thinking, wow, I had no idea. But she was um, incensed that they would come in the way, and they were very bedraggled looking for sure. But that taught me a lot. So when I, when I was preparing for this, I looked up, and here are the restrictions, the dress restrictions about court. They're very strict. Men have to wear long pants, no shorts, nothing in between. You have to wear a collared shirt that is <laughs> tucked in. Ah, that's death to some men. Yes, a tucked in collared shirt, shoes and socks. You can't be going in there with shoes, but no socks. Um, and women, um, a dress, a modest skirt. Um, you can wear long pants and a shirt. This is what is forbidden in court. Shorts, halter, tank top, hats, and I'll get back to that in just a minute. Hats are forbidden in court. Flip-flops, anything torn, ragged, like the jeans, and exposed midriff, etc., etc. Did you realize that? And I looked up why hats were forbidden, and I found out that the reason that hats are forbidden and have remained that from the early days is years and years and years and years ago, probably a hundred years ago and more, hats were a sign of a prosperity. They were a status symbol too. And so if you came into court with a hat that looked like, man, that, that, and he went to the haberdashery and he bought a, you know, an expensive hat or one that was ragged and torn would also say something else about your, um, your lot in life. And so what they did is they said, no, 
There's no status in court. In court, you bow to the authority that the court is. The court and the judge, we have the authority. You can't bring your status or lack thereof into the courtroom. Isn't that interesting? But I just thought, wow, you know, the court says, you can't even come into my presence. And, she, and without those kids, they hadn't said one word. And she just looked up and saw. And so what, what it means is that they were showing lack of respect just by the way they dressed themselves without showing any signs, without saying one single word. They could have been the most polite kids in the world, but they didn't have a chance because of the way they presented themselves. And what, what the court says to us when we appear in court, take this seriously. This is not a game. I'm the authority and you're here for a reason. So you need to be clean and considerate and respect the authority. Isn't that something? Just by the way that you're dressed. In a job interview, I read that you, when you go in for a job interview, there's some big, big no-nos. No flash, no, nothing stained or wrinkled, no sandals or flip-flops, not even casual clothing. If you go into a job interview, you come in there as as put together as you can possibly be put together because that says something. It speaks. It speaks about how, un, um, how important this is to you. It speaks about how serious you are about this interview and what you want. And what I found interesting about laying this foundation is that we accept all of these things without a comment, hardly. We don't even think about it. We go, oh, we can't wear that, but we can't do that. And we just go ahead and do it. And all of these things that I just talked about are external. And so what we wanna talk about in these next weeks are the internal dressing of ourselves, which reveals external. You see, it starts inside and it reveals to the outside. Because you could do, those kids could have gone and changed their clothes and came, came back and looked spiffy and anything and they could just be as rotten to the cores as to be because that's all external. But God is interested in the internal turning in to the external. And so that's the journey that we're on and how we influence the world in which we live, our culture, our families, and the kingdom that we serve. So, Vicki, how does this work? What are the steps? Well, let me just go th with you through the steps of our day. In the morning, we get up, we roll out of bed. We're always smiling when we get up. Right. <laughs> Couldn't resist that. We wash, wash our face, brush our teeth, and then we remove, take off, discard our PJs, our nightgowns, our T-shirts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we put on fill in the blank. We put on wherever we're going, whatever our plans are. What is my plan? That determines what I put on after I take off. We remove and then we put on. So if I'm going to clean the house, if I'm going to my job, if I'm going to work out this morning, if I'm going to go shopping, if I'm going to go visit someone, if I'm going to go to the doctors, am I going to go to court? Am I going to take a little trip? That determines how we then put on after we've taken off our night clothes. It determines how we dress, our destination and our plans and our mission. What is our mission for that day? Determines how we dress. Then after the day, whatever we did that day, we come in and we take off the day. We take off our work clothes. Most of us, this is just, you know, an across the board type of deal. We take them off and we put on something else. Maybe it's just some casual clothes, some sweats. But for some of us, <laughs> we put on our PJs at 6 p.m. <laughs> because that's the end of the day. And we might take a quick shower and we already have our PJs and pajamas on and we're all just ready for bed. Our makeup's off and our skin is clean and, and that's what we put on. And then um, at bedtime, we remove again. We take off whatever we put on after work or after our workout and we put on what we're going to sleep in. <clears throat> so you see how we do that in our natural? We take off and put on, take off and put on, take off and put on. De and that determines what we put on, what we take off and what we put on, what we're doing, where we're going. The other thing, we cleanse ourselves as we change. We don't go and work out and come home 
Uh, like if you work out super early and you go to work, you don't come home and put on your work clothes. You cleanse yourself before you put on your clothes. Shower, bath, before you get dressed. <clears throat> and we do that again and again and again. We we, so we not only cleanse our self, but we cleanse our clothes. We care for them. We monitor their wear, their suitability. And we go, I live in this. You know, this is so important to me. I live in this. So I got to take care of this. But we clean our clothes. We put them in the laundry. We get the sweat and the just the everyday wear off of them. Sometimes we look in our closet or we take something out and we go, oh, wow, it's time to repair, to, to replace this. This is, uh, this is so, you know, 2010. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't really do that. Or we just go, this has had it. I need, to, I, need, I need to replace it. Or we go, oh, I need to mend this. This isn't looking so good. I didn't realize that it had a hole there. I need to fix this. I need to mend it at a seam or a hole or whatever. Uh, and sometimes it's neither. Replacing or mending, but sometimes we have to discard the item of clothing completely, get rid of it. It doesn't work anymore. It's not right for my life. It's not flattering to me. So I have to actually get rid of it. If it's too bad, we don't even give it away. We just throw it away. If it's not too bad, but we know it's not good for us, we can take it to Goodwill or our clothes closet at church or whatever. In these next weeks, we're going to be discovering what God says, what God says about what we wear, why we wear it, and how we clothe ourselves with his desire, and what adornments that we need to alter. Do we need to alter some adornments in our life or repair? Do we need to repair things in our lives, the adornments that God has given in our life, or that we've picked up on our own? Or do we need to discard clothes in our closet, in our spiritual closet, completely get rid of them? They're not right for me. I don't know how they got in here. There's too big of a hole in that. I've got to get rid of that. Um, <clears throat> and the question is why? Why are we gonna be talking about this? Second Corinthians 5, 4. What we crave above all is to be clothed so that what is temporary and mortal can be wrapped completely in life. The one who has worked and tailored us for this is God. Isn't that beautiful? God is our tailor. He's tailoring us and he's putting things in us. This is temporary. It says, what is temporary? This is it, my flesh. This is the temporary part. And this is the mortal part. But, he, he, but here, uh, Paul is saying, what is temporary and mortal can be wrapped in what is life. That's the internal. So that what is in us comes out of us. And God tailors us for this work. And this is what God's word, and this is what we're going to learn about. God's word speaks about these things. Casting off. Taking off. Things to put away. Things to destroy things to renew, and what we put on, add on, clothe, adorn, show, keep, and reveal. <clears throat> and he helps us to learn how to practically apply these to our everyday world, to our world, to our families. We must, and they must know the truth. And many times God reveals the truth to our culture, to our families, to where we work, to our church, to our neighbors, through us. That's, his, that's the biblical pattern. He could have done it in any other way, but he didn't. He chose us who've been redeemed, who are just full of all kinds of stuff. But he goes, you're the ones, you're the ones that I want to use so that my kingdom can be seen on this earth. And part of the way that he does that is to clothe us with what we need so that what comes out of us speaks to our generation, speaks to our culture. So in closing, 
I, Vicki, and I pray you, we want to know first. We want God to reveal this to us. And then we want to act and obey on it. Lord, I realize you said this. I, I, I And now I want to obey it. To, because to know it and not to do it, it's fruitless. It's a moot point, right? If we don't, if we don't actually do something. And God is there to help us to do it. And so these next weeks, we're all together, and me included, going to be taking an inventory of our spiritual closets and to see what in the world is in my closet. I think we might be surprised what hangs there. Oh, I didn't even realize that was there. I forgot the Lord had given me that. How wonderful. We may be discovering things in our spiritual closet that we can clothe ourselves with that um, that we need, that God needs us to put on. And we may also discover things that we need to discard, to get rid of, to mend, to repair. Oh, I forgot. Yes, that's still good. I need to get back to that. You see where I'm, I think you see where I'm going with this. And I pray we, that together, not only will we discover and not only will we obey, but that we would find this transformative how we clothe ourselves in 2021, how we clothe ourselves and how that speaks to our culture and how that speaks to our families, how that speaks to our communities, how that speaks even to the kingdom in which we live is so important. And I believe God has great things for all of us. So we're going to be on a journey together and I'm so excited for it. I thank you again for tuning in and I will see you next week. God bless you with a peaceful and joyful uh, time this week. You might want to start looking in your spiritual closet right now. Uh, it's a, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and just to see, you know, I hope she covers this. And if you want me to cover something that you discover, please let me know. Please let me know an area that you that you think would be interesting and, and informative and most of all, spiritually gr growing for those of us that may not be struggling with what you are, or maybe if you found something that is so exciting you can't wait to share, guess what I found in my spiritual closet? It was pushed way to the back, and I didn't even remember that it was there. But I found it, and I'm so grateful that God showed it to me and that he didn't get rid of it, but he let me keep it, and, uh, and now I'm going to use it again. So you never know what's ahead for us. I'm excited about it. God bless you. I'll see you next week.